Malulele, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Susana Suiswiki. Coming up, Tonga's Prime Minister remains as the country's leader following a vote of no confidence in him. Also, disposition to the neglect of human rights is a critical space for advocacy on Rambi. We speak with the international advocacy group helping the Barnabin community find justice. And later, So now we're starting to see some record numbers, even in terms of the people coming through the gardens. Businesses in the Cook Islands are thriving post-pandemic. The motion of no confidence against Tonga's Prime Minister, Hua Gavame Liku Siasi Sovaleni, has failed to win support. The motion, submitted by MP Aisake Eke, accused the Prime Minister of mismanaging the state-owned airlines, Lulutai, as well as not following appropriate procedures in allocating funds. The Prime Minister denied the allegations. Joining me to talk more about the failed motion of no confidence is RNZ Pacific's Tonga correspondent, Kalafi Moala. Manolele Kalafi, talk us through what happened in the latest parliament session. Well, uh, of course, there, there was a motion uh, for the um, uh, of no confidence against the prime minister. And so this afternoon, uh, after two days of uh, going over the, the points of the motion and then the response from the prime minister and his government, they uh, had a ballot today, and the motion was defeated. In other words, the prime minister continues to be the prime minister. And the defeat, uh, the defeat was uh, 14 uh, votes uh, for the prime minister and 11 uh, against him. Why was the motion of no confidence filed in the first place? Well, uh, they, much of the of the allegations were uh, were issues of uh, poor governance. And uh, they focus on uh, things concerning the time when they were uh, debating the um, budget, uh, that there were uh, reports of, of previous years uh, were, were not filed from, from different departments. So, so there were a number of, of things, 46 points altogether, uh, in which they... Um, uh, um, you know, that supported the motion. And uh, that's why it took all day yesterday, 12 hours of uh, of meeting from 10 in the morning until 10 at night, and then today all the way from 10 until uh, 12. And, uh, and then in the afternoon sessions, uh, they decided it was enough, it was time to, uh, to take a, a vote. And, uh, and so they did. I understand one of the major issues was around the mismanaging of the state-owned airlines, Lulutai. Are you able to elaborate that a bit further, please? Yes. One of the big issues, of course, was that they had felt that uh, um, Lulutai Airlines, which which was a um, government-owned, and and there was a lot of uh, of debate uh, on it. There were a lot of uh, people that were in opposition, feeling that the airlines should be run by a, a private sector um, company. Uh, the other thing too that was interesting, it was brought up that uh, even though uh, Lulota Airlines was owned and operated by the government, it was not part of. Uh, what they call the public enterprises. It was not listed with the enterprises of the government, and which which basically meant that uh, the public enterprises were accountable to give reports to to uh, parliament and so on. But the Lulutai uh, Airlines the, was uh, they, they they were not accountable to anybody. It was, they were just like a private company that was established. Anyway, the, things came to a head when. It was discovered that uh, recently that the government was purchasing an air plane uh, to the tune of 6.5 US uh, a million US dollars, and so there was the question of wh- where did the money come from, and uh, part of the money it, it came out in Parliament was uh, was uh, borrowed from the retirement fund, uh, and so there there were all kinds of uh, charges and accusations that this should never have happened. 
and there were charges and accusations and conflict of interest because the prime minister, who is the basically the chairman of the board of Lulutai Airlines, he was also the chairman of the board that, uh, of the retirement fund. So uh, you have one entity borrowing from another entity, and and the prime minister was the chairman of uh, of both. So these was the, these were the kind of things that we brought up, and there were a number of other issues. But Lulutai Airlines was uh, definitely a, a major part of that. And how did Huakave Meliku respond to all of these allegations? Yes, he 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 made res- responses. Of course, all forty six of them, he, he answered them, and he. Uh, explained that there was nothing illegal that uh, that was done. Maybe it could have been done differently by somebody else, but uh, he explained their processes, that uh, it was not uh, uh, illegal, it was not against the Constitution, and he gave reasons why they did what they did. And um, so, uh, as it was uh, presented to Parliament, obviously the majority of uh, members of Parliament believed him, and... uh, and voted for him. No, that was that was the main thing that uh, uh, Tong has been waiting for. And uh, I think another thing that needs to be mentioned: uh, since the reform of 2010, we've had four governments, and each one of those governments have had vote of no confidence, or should I say, unsuccessful vote of no confidence. And so this is uh, nothing new, the same thing with this government. There, there was expectation that maybe uh, this vote of no confidence was going to be successful, but definitely not. And so we have uh, uh, the prime minister and his government continues uh, until 2025 when there is the next uh, the new election. Amid fears of a renewal of mining on the already decimated Kiribati island of Banaba, the residents there and on Rambi Island in Fiji have been receiving help from an international advocacy group called ICAAD. The mining plans are now in abeyance after an outcry over Banabans being shut out of the decision-making and ICAAD wants the world to be aware of their plight. Don Wiseman spoke with ICAAD's Erin Thomas. So we are an international human rights advocacy center. And despite our very impressive sounding name, we are a small but mighty team of five. (laughs) And most of our work is in the Pacific just by the nature of our relationships. So we've been working in the region for about a decade now. And we work in areas of advocacy, data and research, as well as artivism and capacity building, looking to amplify the great work that grassroots advocates and civil society are doing on the ground. All right. Recently, you've done work in Banaba, the Kiribati Island that was pretty much decimated by phosphate mining 50, 60, 70 years ago. How did you become involved in Banaba? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, we've actually been working with the Rambi Island Community Hub. And for context, Rambi Island is in Fiji and operates as a semi-autonomous jurisdiction where Bonobans were relocated to in 1945 due to the destruction caused by the British Phosphate Commission and almost a century of phosphate mining. So we started working with the Rambi Island Community Hub in the way that we always begin partnerships by chance and obvious alignment, uh, it became clear that that history of displacement of the Bonobans and dispossession to the neglect of human rights is a critical space for advocacy on Rambi, as well as providing important lessons to the world as we think about climate displacement, which is how we connected on our bigger project around the right to life with dignity, which is focused on expanding legal protections for those displaced by the climate crisis. So our goal is as an advocacy center is to help make sure their story, which is so often forgotten, um, is heard by decision makers in the region and that their demands, which are so often relegated, are met with action. The issues that have become very apparent on Barnaba in recent times have been to do with water or the lack of it. And the seemingly, as far as the Barnabans are concerned, the, the somewhat blasé response of the 
Kiribati government and the governments of the countries that benefited from the mining. I think there has been some response from New Zealand and Australia, but it was perhaps belated. And as far as Rambi Island goes, this odd situation where the Rambi Council of Elders was disbanded and replaced by a government-appointed administrator, all quite odd developments and certainly not to the liking of the people on, in either place. What have you suggested? Yeah, well, I mean, the whole situation points to a community that's really fallen between the cracks of jurisdictions, with no one really wanting to take responsibility, whether it's the Fiji government, the Kiribati government, or the colonial powers who mined Bonaba itself, right? The UK, Australia, and New Zealand. So we actually worked at the Rambi Island Community Hub and a local working group to develop a policy brief which is the culmination of locally-led community dialogue sessions and collaborative research with our ICAD team and our pro bono law firm partner, Clifford Chen, looking at some of these issues that emerge when you fall between the cracks, essentially. So when it comes to reparations for the destruction from mining, you run into the issue of states being the only eligible entity in many court systems to bring claims against countries. Right, including the countries responsible for mining and displacement, that would require Fiji or Kiribati to bring action on behalf of the Bonobans. But what we've seen with recent developments, including this mining agreement that was signed very undemocratically and illegally, given the obligations of the Fiji government to provide for Bonobin governance, is that falling between the cracks is more the norm um, and sort of represents this continued pattern of colonialism that Bonobans are experiencing on Rambi and around the world. So there's been a call to review the Bonobin Settlement Act, which is the Fijian legislation allowing for governance of Bonobin affairs by Bonobans living on Rambi, which also obviously impacts Bonaba itself and Bonobans living overseas. So we see how all of these things continue and, and what's really feared as we advance is history repeating itself and this Australian mining company taking advantage of the same issues that have been in place. Yes, this legislation is very interesting, isn't it? Was it passed prior to Fiji becoming independent? The Bonobin Settlement Act was passed in 1970 and it allows for Bonobin governance of Bonobin affairs. Now, in the recent years, in the last decade, the Fijian government has not allowed for the reinstatement of the Rambi Council of Leaders, which is supposed to be governing Bonobin affairs by Bonobins for Bonobins on Rambi, and have opted instead for or this Council of Leaders, which has not had an election held, which is sort of the pathway in which the Fijian government would allow it to be reinstated, instead is being represented by a single appointed Fiji government administrator, uh, which is a far cry from democracy and is also how we see this mining agreement signed without the knowledge of the acting interim Council of Leaders, which has not been given its governing authority due to neglect by the Fiji government. Now, they're meant to, according to the legislation, to have dual citizenship, uh, if they want, I suppose. But this applies in some cases and not in others. What's going on there? Yeah, that's a great question and one that has emerged in a lot of the community dialogue sessions. We're actually working with our law firm partner, Clifford Chance, at the moment to develop a citizenship handbook to really clarify these pathways for Bonobans living on Rambi, but also overseas as well. So Bonobans have citizenship rights to both Kiribati and Fiji and can hold dual citizenship. However, in practice, these rights are difficult to secure and are poorly upheld by the governments involved. So really clarifying those issues has been a whole process in terms of building out a handbook, um, but hopefully in the next few months we'll be able to iron out some of those pathways um, that Bonobans can take at the moment, but also some clear pathways for legislative change to make that access improved, right? Citizenship means access to education, services, and of course, family. And for those living not on Bonaba, it means access to their ancestral lands as well, which is why it's a critical issue for Bonobans around the world. Yes, I was talking with an elder from uh, Rambi who was saying that the Bonobans want to be able to rehabilitate the island and they want international help to do that. Is it feasible to rehabilitate it? There have been a lot of discussions um, about that being possible and certainly it's an obligation of those who mind 90% of the island's surface to pursue that avenue as opposed to further mining. I think there have been conversations about this, but because the government has been prioritizing profits over people, um, and it would be a costly endeavor, although 
certainly with many potential benefits, including ecotourism and sustainable economic development on Bonaba, there's been a lack of interest in that direction. So the calls that we're hearing from the Rambi Island Community Hub and other advocates is to focus attention on rehabilitation, which has been the call for decades now and is also what was promised by the British Phosphate Commission in the early 1900s. When we hear Centrex, this Australian mining company, promising potential rehabilitation, it just echoes that empty promise because to date, no land has been rehabilitated. And we saw the UK fight tooth and nail in court to take no responsibility for the destruction caused. As far as the Kiribati government goes, what do you think it should be doing with regard to Banaba? Yeah, well, since Bonaba falls within the boundaries and jurisdiction of Kiribati, the calls that are being made, um, and we've sort of uh, helped the Rambi community partners with this petition and to develop these demands, the key demand is around basic needs and access to basic water and food supplies. Um, as you mentioned in your conversation with elders, um, it's very hard to, to do advocacy. It's very hard to do governance. Um, it's very hard to make these big calls if you don't have access to food and water. So ensuring that shipping lines are coming through in order so that people have their basic needs met, that's the top ask of Kiribati. And also seeing how Bonobans really fall through the cracks, ensuring that there's a stronghold in Rambi of Bonobans wanting to protect Bonaba is actually really important, even though it's not taking place on Bonaba itself. And having those two go hand in hand are actually really key demands there. And when we think about basic needs, mining actually destroyed the freshwater lens on Bonaba. So all of these things are really interconnected. And it's on the Kiribati government, the Fiji government, and all the colonial authorities as a part of the British Phosphate Commission to meet the needs of Bonobans. A young Samoan climate activist is praising the United Nations after it set new guidelines for governments to protect the rights of children in the face of deepening climate crisis. It's the first time the UN Committee has specified to its 196 member states that countries are responsible for not only protecting children's rights from immediate harm, but also for foreseeable violations of their rights in the future. Alicia Foon spoke with 17-year-old climate activist Aniva Clark. I think it's an incredible piece of work that hasn't really been done before um, because it's legal guidance on children's rights and the environment with a special focus on climate change, which is really relevant, especially for our part of the world where the effects of climate change are very, very prevalent, specifically in Pacific Islands like Tokelau and Tuvalu. A general comment provides legal guidance for states that are a part of the convention. So 196 countries are a part of the convention. And so that just shows how significant releasing this comment is because all these countries that are a part of it are now obligated to implement the guidance into their um, their own laws and policies. I think it's just a great and very crucial, important step as we head towards climate action because um, children and young people have been calling for action for so long. And I think this is one of the many things and sort of products of that action working because, you know, when lots of the protests were going on in the recent years, those, you know, adults and older people from the older generations would say, this is not working, this is useless, don't waste your time, go to school. Um, But this just shows that there is, that they were listening and they've recognize that there's a call for action and a need for action and they're actually taking um, taking that to accountability. What is your message to the 196 states following the UN's general comment? I think the most important message that, well, that comes from so many of the young people that are aware of general comment 26 is now that, to these states, is that now they've been given this, um, framework and these guidelines on how it's only the beginning because now that it's been done, it's, what are they going to do now? How are they going to take what's been given to them and actually implement it, in, implement it into the community, into their countries, and how are we going to use it to face the climate crisis? What would you suggest they do if you were to talk to maybe one or two policies that governments could implement, what would you like to see on behalf of um, Pacific nations in mind? Governments really need to change the policies around the use of fossil fuels. 
Um, I know that in the in General Comment 26, it specifically talks about um, the importance of phasing out coal, oil, and natural gas and shifting to renewable energy sources. And so I think there are lots of countries that are behind in that. And, and in New Zealand in particular, we have a huge problem with methane. They can try and... Um, make up for those carbon emissions that they that the cows in New Zealand produce and recognize not not only um is it largely contributing to global warming but also it is compromising children's rights. Absolutely. What are your major concerns kind of looking forward and projecting into the future. I understand that, you know, as young people um, and then in school, you're, you're having to learn about climate change and future generations will have to maybe change the way they live, adapt their lifestyle, adapt their choices. Some young people are choosing not to have children because of the immense pressure it would put on resources. And so... Talk to me about some of the things that you're having to consider with climate change in mind. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, I strongly identify with my specific heritage and the fact that climate change, and, um, also known as the climate crisis, because we really are in a crisis, is um, that we risk losing our land and losing our homes um, and you know everything that there's so much more to the land than just it being land back. By losing that, we lose so much of our identity, our heritage, our language, our ancient traditions. We live off the land, but we live for the land. And by losing that, we lose so much of who we are. And I think that losing who we are is the biggest risk that climate change um, throws at us. Because for islands like Pukilau and Suvalu, which are like low-lying atolls, um, if climate change continues to occur those communities risk losing their, their islands completely and with losing that they lose hundreds and hundreds of years of their connection to the land, their connection to their ancestors, the spirituality that that holds the you know, mana for sure within that place they begin to lose that identity and, and connection to having to become of that kind of refugee and because meeting, they don't have a place to be able to their home. Their home. And losing that is such a huge risk that I think a lot of governments in larger countries forget to recognise. General comment is the beginning of global change. The Cook Islands tourism industry is getting back to where it was pre-pandemic after a disruptive few years. But tourists are currently finding it difficult to get a rental car and many hotels are at capacity. Caleb Fotheringham, who's in Rarotonga, spoke with business owners in the sector. Tamai Vatua Vira, affectionately known as Captain Tama, and the owner of Captain Tama's Lagoon Cruises, says business is very good, even better than what it was pre-pandemic. There's more. I see there's more. I can see the number of people coming down to me. Uh, although there's only two of us doing the, the cruises, but I think we can both see how many people are coming down every day. He puts the success partially down to the multiple airlines now flying into Rarotonga, from Hawaii, Tahiti, Australia and New Zealand. They're coming in with uh, bumps on the seat. I've been away myself and the flight I flew out on was full and the flight I came in back in was full. So that can only mean that the, the island is pumping. The Cook Islands tourism industry accounts for over 60% of the country's economy. It came to a grinding halt in early 2020 when borders shut. The nation fully reopened its borders to visitors in 2022 after a short-lived travel bubble between the Cooks and New Zealand in mid-2021. Since, the sector has been dealing with multiple challenges, like labour shortages and tough shoulder seasons during the Southern Hemisphere summer. But Cook Islands Tourism Industry Council President Liana Scott says business is booming right now. Everything's nice and busy at the moment. Activity and tour operators are busy. It's difficult getting a car again. So all those <laughs> good problems to have uh, exist right now. Tiana Barnett, who runs Bananui Gardens Cafe, is another business seeing record demand. 
So now we're starting to see some record numbers, even in terms of the people coming through the garden. So last week we had a record for garden entries coming through the garden. So yeah, it's been, it's been pretty good. It's holding steady. But Ms Scott says it's not easy for everyone, with some trying to catch up on large debt repayments that were put on hold when the country was closed to visitors. Even though we're out of that rut and everyone's doing well, it doesn't mean they're out of the woods yet either. I think compounding interest rates uh, really makes a difference to what the repayment schedule is like for a lot of businesses, especially those that either had just opened or had just expanded prior to COVID. Ms Scott also says businesses still have to contend with a low tourism season at the end of the year which was previously buffered with a flight from LA loaded with Northern Hemisphere holidaymakers escaping the winter. Graham West, General Manager at Cook Islands Tourism Australasia, says from a numbers point of view, the nation is still down about 15-20% to of the all-time visitor high. It's getting back to around the 216 levels, and so 219 was the best year we had ever had. So right now we'll probably do this calendar year similar to 216, and I expect next year to be a lot stronger. Mr West says demand is there, but another flight a day is needed out of Auckland to reach the same number of visitors. That's Pacific Ways for today. Don't forget you can listen back on rnzi.com slash programs. We're also on Apple, Spotify and iHeartRadio podcasts. From myself and the team here at RNZ Pacific, to Fasui Fua.